let's dig into the question. So it's a one and a half hour paper for 75 marks. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Question 1a. Given that y is sine 4x um, sec 3x, so you said you're told y equals sine 4x sec 3x, find the y dx using product rule. So using product rule, y equals uv dy over dx is v du over dx plus u dv over dx. In this case, let u be sine 4x and therefore du over dx is something. Let v be equal to sec 3x and therefore dv over dx equals something. Now, what is the u dx if you have sine 4x? Well, first, you know you're going to be doing chain rule. Derivative of 4x is 4, so you write that first. That's chain rule. And then derivative of sine is cosine. So it's now cosine of whatever that, that was, 4x. In this case, we'll do the same thing. we we'll differentiate the inner function first. So derivative of 3x is 3. Derivative of sec x, of sec, basically, is what? Does anyone want to tell us? It's, it's in the formula sheet, so we're just going to look at the formula sheet. AQA formula sheet. Maths. And you would see it's the... Sec x gives you tan x, so we're just going to expand it. The derivative of sec is sec x tan x, so easy. So that's sec 3x because it's whatever that function is tan 3x. So that's your sec x tan x. Sec of the angle, tan of the angle, that's what it was. Okay, and therefore dy over dx is going to be v times du dx, so that's this times that, and that's 4 sec 3x cos 4x, and you have plus u times dv over dx, so that those two now, that's 3 sine 4x sec 3x tan 3x. Okay, and that looks like we can factor out we can factor out the sec function. So if you like you can factor out the sec 3x or if you like you can just leave it like that. Now find it B part says find integral of 6x over 2x squared plus 3 with respect to x. So we have to integrate this. But if you look closely, this is going to be difficult to integrate if you tried using what you think you already know. Partial fractions would not help either because it's hard to split this into into factors, I mean the denominator. And if you cannot factorize the, de the denominator, partial fractions would be almost too difficult. How about we look at this as substitution problem where the derivative of the bottom seems to be what's at the top. Derivative of the denominator is 4x. That could be 4x if we just kick the 6 out and write 4 here and divide by 4. So that means we could have a case where you have lean of the denominator. So I'm just going to write this top to look like the bottom. So it's going, to, I mean, like the derivative of the denominator. So I'm just going to change this to 6x. And at this point, you should agree that I've not done anything weird. But derivative of this guy is 4x. So I'm going to put a 4 there. 
and divide by 4. 4 over 4 is just 1, so nothing has changed, it's fine. But while the outside factor is 3 over 2, integral of what you have in there is going to be lin of 2x squared plus 3. And if you've read something like this before, you would agree that because the derivative of the denominator is what you have at the, at the numerator, the answer will just be lean of your denominator. And uh, there you go. It's something you can also find in the uh, in the formula sheet. So here, so it's not something impossible to use. It's in the formula sheet. Integral of f prime over f is lean of f plus c. Just make sure you put that. The only reason I did not bother to put that modulus sign is because 2x squared plus 3 would always be positive because x squared is always positive. But if you think it may not be positive, for example, if it's 2x plus 3, you need to put that symbol to show that we do not plan to find the lean of a negative number. Alright, so we can go to question 2 now. And you can see that the first question was a, was an easy question, so that's to welcome you to the exam, actually, to make you feel relaxed, like you're going to, to do well in this course. Now, the second one says, use the mid-ordinate rule with five strips to find an estimate for this integral. So, they want you to integrate using numerical methods, and in this case, mid-ordinate rule from 0 0.5 to 1.5 e to the 3x minus x to the 3 dx. So what you need to do is to go into the formula booklet again and check out what the formula for mid-ordinate numerical integration is. So we can see we have what they call numerical integration using trapezium rule. We have the newton raphsons iteration and what other numerical method do we have? Uh, so it's not given. Right, so it's one of those ones you would need to know. And in the mid-ordinate, all you need to do is split it and use those three um, y values, or basically two strips, and solve. But then I wouldn't be doing numerical integration with you because that's trivial. I do not like to spend time doing that. What I would do is the B part which wants you to actually integrate it as a normal integration problem. So it says a curve has equation y equals e to the 3x minus x cube. Find the exact values of the coordinates of the stationary points of the curve and determine the nature of these stationary points. Seven max, okay, it's a seven marker. Now, for you to be able to find the coordinates of the stationary points, you need to solve for dy dx and equate that to zero. So, if y equals that, we need to find dy dx, not integrate. So, it's opposite of what we just did, or what we were supposed to do earlier. So, y equals e to the 3x minus x cubed. You're trying to work out dy over dx. Well, this is another case of chain rule because you have function of a function. So we say let u equals 3x minus x to the 3 and therefore y equals e to the u. Okay, so y equals e to the u. Looking at y equals e to the u, dy du is, is again e to the u because exponential will always be the same. Whereas, looking at u equals 3x minus x cubed, du dx can be said to be 3 minus 3x squared. Fine. If you know the u over dx and you know the y over the u, multiplying both of them is what chain rule is all about. So, dy over dx is dy over du times du over dx. Now, you're going to need chain rule in many different questions. It comes up under... Uh, where you have volume or population or whatever. Take note, the only reason chain rule makes sense is because we expect du to cancel du, leaving you with dy over dx, and that's why it's correct. So it doesn't matter how many dy, how, how many derivatives you have, as long as the top cancels the bottom, you're fine. And I'll give you an, an, an example. 
dA over dB is the same thing as dA over dC times dC over dK times dK over dB. Because eventually, dC cancels dC, dK cancels dK, and you're left with dA, dB, which is what that sense. That's what we call chain rule. Chain rule, okay? So going by chain rule, dy over dx is going to be dy over du, which we said was e to the u, times du over dx, which we said was 3 minus 3x squared. Now, we don't need to keep it as e to the u because we know what u is. So let's use that to write the final answer. So therefore, dy over dx is 3 minus 3x squared e to the 3 minus I'm oh, sorry, e to the 3x minus x cubed. Now, that's not what the question is about for 7 marks. Of course, you need to do more than that. The question is asking that we find the stationary points and tell them the coordinates of that stationary point. And of course, we need to therefore equate this to 0. So, at stationary point, dy over dx equals 0. And therefore, we go, on, we go on to write 3 minus 3x squared times e to the 3x minus x cubed must be equal to 0. We want to find x. If you have a multiplied by b to give you 0, it's either a is 0 or b is 0. So in this case, you have two things multiplying. You have this multiplying that to give 0. So it's either this is 0 or that is 0. Now, you would remember from the exponential graph that e to the power of anything can never go down to zero. Well, it would take infinity to take negative infinity, rather, to take that down to zero. So, this is the only one that can be zero. So, 3 minus 3x squared equals zero. And therefore, if you factor out the 3, you have 3 into 1 minus x squared equals zero. And that's 3 into 1 minus x into 1 plus x equals 0. Therefore, x is plus 1 or minus 1. Now, I know some of you may have been tempted to just move 3x squared to the other side and divide both sides by 3. Of course, if you do that, you'll come up with x squared equals 1. But never ever in algebra make the mistake of saying, therefore, x equals square root of 1, which is 1. Because x equals plus or minus root 1. That's what it is, not just root 1. So never ever forget the plus or minus, okay? So always do that. Now that we know what x could be, plus or minus 1, we are told to find the exact values of the coordinates. So we know we should have two coordinates, and we are now going to find the exact values. We said before that y equals e to the 3x minus x uh, cubed. So if we know x will be plus 1, y when x is plus 1 would be e to the 3 into plus 1 minus plus 1 to the power 3, which is e to the 3 minus 3, which is e to the 0, which is 1. When y is minus 1, we have e to the 3 into negative 1 minus negative 1 cubed. I'm so sorry, that was meant to be 3 minus 1, because that's 1 to the power 3, not 1 times 3. So that's just 1, and that's e to the 2, e squared, so that's e squared, okay, not 1, sorry about that. And here you have e to the 3, e to the negative 3, plus 1, it's plus 1 because negative 1 to the power 3 is negative 1, so negative negative becomes plus, and that's e to the negative 2. So the coordinates are minus a uh, plus 1 comma e to the 2 and minus 1 comma e to the negative 2. What we now need to say is if this is a minimum point or a maximum point and if that is a minimum point or a maximum point and for you to be able to tell what is a minimum or a maximum point in, you need to find the second derivative now, there are many other ways to do this, but let's just take the rule, okay? You need to find derivative. So we set dy over dx equals 3 minus 3x squared e to the 3x minus x cubed. 
to find the second derivative we would need to use product rule because you have two functions multiplying and this one would need chain rule because it's cumbersome but it's okay because we've only recently done it in, the, in trying to find the y over the x in fact itself is the derivative of that so if this is taken as our u and that's taken as our v v du over dx plus u dv over dx would mean v which is e to the 3x minus x cubed times du over dx the derivative of that is minus 6x plus u which is 3 minus 3x squared derivative of e to the 3x minus x cubed and like I said that is something we did before where we had to find the y dx for that and we came up with using chain rule 3 minus 3x squared e to the 3x minus x cubed so it's, it's, it, it's, it, it is itself so there will be a squared there and e to the 3x minus x cubed so e to the 3x minus x cubed seems to be common so it can go out so e to the 3x minus x cubed can go out and in the bracket you are left with minus 6x minus 3 minus 3x squared all squared so plus and that is your second derivative so d squared y dx squared when x is 1 we would see if that's positive or negative e to the 3 times 1 is 3 minus 1 squared is 2 so that's positive let's see if this is going to be positive or negative minus 6 times 1 is minus 6 plus 3 minus 3 times 1 squared that's 3 minus 3 which is 0 so you're left with a negative therefore 1 comma e squared is a maximum point and you can expect the other one to be a minimum point but if you're not convinced you can check it yourself it's still going to be positive here because negative 1 negative 1 cube and all that would only make this to be either positive or negative but the number itself is to be positive but when you have negative 1 there that becomes plus 6 when you have negative 1 doesn't matter that still goes to 0 so plus 6 make it positive okay we can do it just to fulfill our righteousness so this squared y or the x squared at x equals minus 1 will be e to the um, minus 4 sorry minus 2 into plus 6 plus 0 which is positive so minimum point right let's not take too much time it's only seven max i wouldn't sleep i wouldn't lose sleep over that question now the next question on question three says use this substitution u equals cos 2x to find integral of cos squared 2x sine cubed 2x dx it's only five marks so you should only spend five minutes on this question now when students see this kind of question they, they begin to panic but one thing you should know is that for them to have given you that substitution um, trick they know that that's going to help you solve it quickly so let's be diligent enough and use that so if that's the, the, the substitution we're meant to use let's therefore rewrite this as u squared because that's cos 2 squared that's cos 2x all squared so that's u squared sine cubed 2x dx we shouldn't be having any x there at all can we look for how to replace the x in terms of du yes we can by finding du over dx so let's look at this critically if u is cos 2x what's du over dx using chain rule that is 2 and then derivative of cos is negative sine so negative sine 2x so if du over dx is negative 2 sine 2x 
try to make the x the subject and you would have dx to be negative 1 over 2 sine 2x du. And that is what we'll end up replacing the x now. Because we don't want to have dx here, we want to have it as du. So that becomes integral of u squared sine cubed 2x. Instead of writing dx, I'm going to write that. So there's a negative outside and there's a 1 over 2 outside. Let's just write the over sine 2x du. Of course, that is going to cancel the power to, and reduce it to 2 because it's going to take one of them out. And that leaves you with minus half integral of u squared sine squared 2x du. Well, worry not about the sine squared 2x because it's about to go. Remember that u is only cos 2x and u squared is cos squared 2x. And how does that relate to sine squared 2x? If cos squared is 1 minus sine squared, then obviously sine squared would be 1 minus cos squared. So I would replace this guy with 1 minus cos squared 2x, which is 1 minus u squared. So this whole thing now becomes minus half integral of u squared into 1 minus u squared du. And that, if I expand, becomes minus half integral of u squared minus u to the 4 du. And of course, who cannot integrate a straight polynomial? If you integrate that problem, so you have um, integral of u squared minus u to the 4 du. And that's just going to be, add, you add 1 to the power u to the 3, divide by the new power, okay, and you add 1 to the other power, divide by the new power, and don't forget to add your constant, arbitrary constant. That's not the end, we need to take it back to the question. So u is cos 2x, so that's minus a half, let's just write it out properly, so minus 1 over 6, cos cube 2x, plus 1 over 10, cos to the power 5, 2x. And that is it, all spread out, plus c. Okay, and that looks like all in question 3, very straightforward. I can't, I can't, I can't believe that was all in question 3. Now, question 4 says, the line y equals x and the curve with the equation y equals lean 3x plus 10 over 3x plus 1, where x is positive, intersects at a single point where x is a. Show that a lies between 1 and 2. Now, this is one of the simplest questions you can ever be asked in an exam. If you're told to show that the root of anything at all lies between 1 and 2, or lies between any two points, slot in the value of x into, you know, as one of those numbers, slot in the value of x as the other number again, and you'll notice that instead of having equal to 0, you'd have equal to a positive number and equals to a negative number, which means that the equal to zero root must have happened between those two uh, test values. So what I mean is this, if, if, if f of x is a curve that crosses the x-axis here, this is called the root, right? If f of x is a curve that crosses the x-axis here, we call that point there the root. But if we don't know the root and you want to check if the root is between 1 and 2, then definitely f of 1 must have been positive and f of 2 must have been negative because that's where the roots actually happen between them. So 0 happened between when it was positive and when it was negative. And that's the idea here. So the question is the root of what? We need to know. So let's start by writing out the question y equals x and y equals lean of all the jargons there, 3x plus 10, or 3x plus 1. And they've said these two met at a point. For them to meet, that means we equate them together. So that means x equals lean of 3x plus 10 over 3x plus 1. What I simply did was to say this equation equals that equation. And therefore, if that's the case, when you move all of this one to the left hand side, it should be x minus lean of all that to be 0. So 
x minus ln of all the jargons there must be zero. And whatever x is, for that to be zero is called the root. So that means this is actually a function of x, which we can find the root. But we don't know how to find the root, so we're going to test for two points when x was 1 and when x is 2. One of them must give us a positive number instead of 0. The other one must give us a negative number instead of 0. And that tells us that we've crossed over the root. So when x is 1, that's 1 minus lean of 3 times 1 plus 10, 13. 3 times 1 plus 1, 4. And we'll check the answer now with our calculators. When x is 2, that's 2 minus lean. 2 times, six, um, 2 times 3 is 6 plus 1 plus 10 is 16. 2 times 3 is 6 plus 1 is 7. And we would now use the calculator to see whether we've got a positive and a negative on the two of them. And that's what we must have. So um, I don't know if you can see my calculator. I'm just going to type 1 minus lean of 13 over 4 and close the bracket. And that's a negative number, okay? Minus 0 0.17. So negative in bracket. Okay? Let's try it with a 2 now. So that's 2 minus ln of 16 over 7. Okay, and we close the bracket. And that's positive 1.17. 1.17 positive. And that's all. That shows that the root happened in between. So we can move on to the next question, which says, use the iterative formula to now solve with x1 equals 2, find x2 and find x3. I've always told students that, hey, when you need to use iteration, just your calculator will do it for you. Just do your own part by writing out what you're going to fill up in the paper and then keep pressing answer, answer, answer and your calculator will do the job. This is what I mean. So, <coughs> so you want to do x of the future to be lean of 3x of the present plus 10 over 3x of the present plus 1, right? So that means x2, if x1 has been given to you as 2, x2 would be lean of 3x1 plus 10 over 3x1 plus 1, which is basically lean of 3 times 2, which is 6, plus 10, 16, over 3 times 2 plus 1, 7. So you want to find out that. And then x3 would be you now using your x2 values to solve it. Now, this is even a simple iteration problem. If it was something more complicated, you don't want to start writing, you know, solving this one and then write, typing it on the calculator again and all that. It's cumbersome. So what you do, we are starting with 2, right? So 2 equals... So whenever you press answer, the calculator tells you 2. Good. So we know we have that stored as the answer. Now, lean of a fraction, the top one is 3 times the answer plus 10. And the bottom is 3 times the answer plus 1. Now, whenever the new answer comes, and you press answer again, this becomes the next one. So, equals 0 0.826678. Sorry. Um, excuse me. If I press answer again, it's going to give me the next iteration. And there you go. Oh, sorry, not that. Uh, I was just meant to press equal to. I was only meant to press equal to see what I've done now. I'm so sorry. I was only meant to press equal to. Ah, uh, not answer. All right. Well, it's my loss, isn't it? Uh, I'm going to do that again. Lean 
uh, let's start by saying 2 equals, so 2 is now the answer, uh, lean of a fraction. 3 times the answer, plus 10. Now, please do not laugh at me and say he's doing it the wrong way. He would have got the answer by now, I know. So E equals 0 0.826678 and so on. Then E equals again, and that gives me the next iteration, which is 1.27. 77087 blah blah blah. Now, if I was meant to do a proper, a thorough iteration to get me the final root of this, or the final solution, you can see all I need to do is keep pressing equal, 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 equals, equals, and it will continue going on until it doesn't change anymore. So I'm going to keep pressing equals now. Just wanted to see what I'm doing. So equals 1.05 equals 1.15 equals 1.1 equals. 1.1 equals 1.1 equals 1.1 equals 1.1 again, and I'm going to keep pressing equals till I notice that it's no longer changing, and that's my solution. So now I've stopped. I'm no more pressing the equals, okay? Because I've seen it's not changing. So the actual root, the actual solution to this problem is 1.11985 blah blah blah. But you can see it was easy for me to find out because I just had to keep pressing equals equals equals. So if you want to try that at home. That's something you can try. But then, they didn't ask for that, did they? They just wanted to see x2 and x3, and we've just got that for them. So, what about the decimal places? They said, giving your answer in, two decim in three decimal places. Look at what I did. I wrote everything out first in so many decimal places so that I don't use the wrong one into this. So, you don't want to use three decimal places in here, otherwise you're going to be wrong. So, you want to keep this as four decimal places, throw that here and get this one also in four decimal places but if you need to do the next one it will be more accurate but then at the end you can now say therefore x2 is 0 0.827 in bracket three decimal places and x3 is 1.277 in bracket three decimal places okay <coughs> now he says on the opposite page shows a sketch of part of the graph of this. Draw a cobweb of staircase diagram to show how convergence takes place, indicating the position of x2 and x3. So, in this case, you're trying to show in steps how the iteration would lead onto the root. And you do realize that when it comes to iteration, you are trying to converge onto something. So, if that's actually where it crosses, and you start with a number here, your iteration would go like that, or could go like that. Sorry, x is increasing, yeah? So it would go in steps until it gets down to the roots, like that. So if your iteration, you would notice that the iteration needs to be reducing in the, in the gap. So that's what it means to converge. So it needs to be reducing in how wide it travels until it finally gets to the root and stops changing. But then, um, I'm probably not in the best position to explain cobwebs to you. I'm not a fan of Spider-Man, really. So I'll let you check the textbook. But then, that's the root. We know it's meant to converge at the center of that place where they meet. So it needs to gradually drive towards it. Now, the cobweb in this case, you don't, you don't have a line diagram. What you have is two graphs. So what you have is within those two gaps, within the gaps, you're going to keep going within, I mean, within the two until you finally reach um, where you have the intersection. All right, like I said, I'm not the best person to explain that. Now, question five, four marks. I like questions like this. Functions. F of x is lean 3x plus 1. G of x is derivative of f of x. The inverse of f is f prime. So be careful here, okay? G of x is, sorry, the inverse of x is f inverse. Find expressions for f inverse and g of x. Good. So f of x has been given as lean 3x plus 1. They want you to find f inverse of x. To do that, you probably know that you just need to write x as a subject now. <coughs> so, let's say f of x equals lean 
of 3x plus 1. We want to make x the subject, so take exponential of both sides. So e to the power f of x is 3x plus 1. To make x the subject, move your, minus, your plus 1 to the other side. So that's 3x equals e to the f of x minus 1. Divide by 3, so x is 1 third e to the f of x minus 1. Well, that's what happens when you make x the subject. But in terms of writing this as the inverse function, what you would say is that 1 over 3 e to the x, you call that guy x, 1 over 3 e to the x minus 1. So because we're talking about the inverse, that f of x becomes the x, and x becomes the function f of x, f inverse. Now, g, in, g of x is what we are told to find next. G of x simply needs to be the derivative of f of x. So, derivative of ln 3x plus 1. And for u, you know this is chain rule. Let u be 3x plus 1 and, and so on and so forth. But I will just be fast about this. I'm just going to put a 3 in front. What's the derivative of ln? It's 1 over. So, that's 1 over 3x plus 1. And there you go. Um, derivative of 3x, ln 3x plus 1. It then goes on to say, show that the equation f, to, uh, f inverse equals g of x can be rearranged into that form. Now, that's a good trap. It will let you know if your answers in the previous questions were correct or wrong. So we're going to try to do that. So f inverse being equal to g of x means that what we said was our f inverse, 1 over 3 e to the x minus 1, should be equal to 3 over 3x plus 1. Can we solve, please, to see if we get the same as did they have if we rearrange? Well, first thing is, we would take everything except e to the x to the other side, because you can see the lin that they have there must have come from e to the x. So let 3 go there. So that's e to the x minus 1 equals 9 over 3x plus 1. Add 1 to both sides, so e to the x is therefore 9 over 3x plus 1 plus 1. Now, 3x plus 1 over 3x plus 1 is same as 1, so 9 plus 3x plus 1 over 3x plus 1, and that's also 9 over 3x plus 1. So, if I expand, if I just add them up, it's e to the x equals 3, 3x plus 10, over the, the LCM, which is 3x plus 1. So if e to the x is all that, then take lean of both sides, leaves you with x equals lean of that. 3x plus 10 over 3x plus 1. And by the time you get this, you'll be rest assured that you've not just got their two marks, but that means the, the answer you gave for the four marker was also correct. And you'll be happy, wouldn't you? Question 6. For how many marks? For 6 marks. <laughs> That's a nice one. Use integration by parts. Now let me tell you something. It's not a joke when they talk about integration by part. Many people worry a lot about integration by part because it could really get complicated if you choose the wrong choice. If you, if you make the wrong choice. And this is what to do. Integral of 3x over square root of 2x minus 1 dx from 1 to 5, okay. We know that using integration by part, integral u dv equals uv minus integral v du. That's the rule, and this rule came from product rule. The one we call product rule. That's where it came from. But I'm sure you don't want to know how. At this point, you just don't care, do you? All right. So let's say u v v du. Which one would be u? Which would be our v? Well, we don't know yet. Let's write this properly. So that's integral 3x, 2x minus 1 to the power of a negative half. Now, that's more like it. Now we can talk about u's and v's, right? Let the guy that can be differentiated to become simple be your u. And the guy who cannot be differentiated to become easy, let that one be your dv. 
This is the guy that can be easily differentiated and it will get simpler. So let that be u. So if u equals 3x, I'm happy to say du would be 3. And that means this the question will become simpler. That can therefore be your dv. So if dv equals 2x minus 1 to the power of a negative half, what is my v going to be? Obviously, it's the integral of that form, that, that expression. Now, don't look at me saying, how do we get the integral? It's substitution. Uh, substitution. What is the derivative of 2x minus 1? It's 2, so 1 over 2. Let that wait for you. Now, if that had been u to the power minus half, what would you do? You would have simply added 1 to the power, and that would give you half, and you would have divided by the new power, that would have given you over half. Over 1 half is the same as times 2. So you have a 2 there, which therefore cancels that 2. So it's fine. All you have there now is just your 2x minus 1 to the power half. All right, all right. Let me not be too fast about it. I'm going to explain that very quickly here. So we said dv was 2x minus 1 to the power minus a half. We we're meant to integrate that. So to integrate 2x minus 1 to the power negative a half, I said let a be 2x minus 1 and therefore dA over dx became 2 and so dx became half dA. And then we went on to say this problem is therefore asking us to integrate a to the power negative a half dx. I can't differentiate, I can't integrate a with respect to x, it has to be with respect to a. So I replace my dx with half dA. So that's now half integral a to the power negative half dA. And if you're integrating anything, it's only about you adding 1 to the power. So that's 1 plus negative half, divided by the new power, 1 plus negative half, right? And that gives you 1 minus half is half. So half cancels half. That leaves you with a to the power half, which is 2x minus 1 to the power half, or square root of 2x minus 1. So we now have v. So this using integration by part becomes u times v. So that's 3x times root 2x minus 1 minus integral v du. And that's your v, and du is 3. So du has made life so easy for us now. And then that's your dv. So 3x root 2x minus 1 minus 3. If I integrate 3x minus 1 to the power half, again, it's as good as dividing by your derivative of that, which is 2. And what I said you would do next? Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. So if you add 1 to that power, it becomes power 3 over 2. And if you divide by the new power, you try to divide by another 3 over 2. So this 3 over 2 would cancel that 3 over 2. And so that's just minus of that to the power 3 over 2. So that gives me 3x minus 2x minus 1. Let me just call it plus 1 now. And outside you have a root 2x minus 1 weighted. And that's just root, that's just x plus 1, root 2x minus 1. Now, I know at this point you'll be like, wait, we don't understand what he has done. Fine. I left this as 3x root 2x minus 1, but I noticed that this is 2x minus 1 to the power 1.5. 2x, point, 2x, 2x minus 1 to the power 1.5 looks like 2x minus 1 times another square root of 2x minus 1. So the square roots can go outside. Leave that 2x minus 1 for us. Leave that 3x for us. So 3x minus 2x minus minus plus 1. And that gives x plus 1 there with the root 2x minus 1 waiting outside. Now, we were meant to integrate from 1 to 5, and we should never lose, lose focus of that. So, if we're integrating from 1 to 5, x plus 1, root 2x minus 1, from 1 to 5, 
would simply be 5 plus 1, 6, root 2 times 5 is 10, minus 1 is 9, minus when it's 1, so 1 times 1 plus 1 is 2, root 2 times 1 is 2, minus 1 is 1. So that's 6 times 3, 18, 2 times 1, 2, leaving you with the answer as 16, and then 6 marks. Look, if you have any questions, okay, feel free to leave a message in the, in the comment section below. Or you can just Skype me and we can discuss this, this solution straightforward. I'm happy to keep explaining till you understand. If you want to Skype me, here is my Skype. I'm always online, so if you drop a message and say, how did you do question six? I'll be like, hey, here, here, here we go. And then we'll do it. Okay? I don't want you still confused after after this video. Yeah. Okay, question seven. Do they have anything more interesting for us? You are given that k is a positive constant by sketching the graphs of y equals f uh, five x minus three k and y equals three into x plus four k on the same axis. Solve this inequality, where five x minus three k is greater than or equal. So 3, absolute of x plus 4k. Good. They only want you to sketch, so you just need to be able to transform graphs. You see, graphs like this are very straightforward, but most people overcomplicate it. Why do you think they've given you 5 max for it? Because it's not difficult. Let me say this. What do you think will be the graph for x modulus? Well, if that's my graph sheet... And that's y, and this is x. Ordinarily, the graph of y equals x would be like this. But the graph of y equals modulus of x means wherever it should have been negative, let it reflect and become positive. So that, and then that. So if I ask you for the graph of y equals x plus 3, Start by drawing for me the graph of y equals x, my x plus 3 without the modulus. It's definitely going to cross at 3 and it's going to go like that, right? Wherever it should have been negative is where it bounces off and becomes positive. So that area below this, what do you think that value would have been? Minus 3? Yes. That's where it bounces off and becomes positive and everything here is taken as well. And if you're told to draw anything else, start by drawing the normal one and then reflect it wherever I should have become negative, wherever it touches the x-axis. So, for that question, it says sketch the graph of y equals modulus of 5x minus 3k, also the graph of y equals 3x plus 4k modulus. Again, it's what I just said. It's straightforward. Let's start with this first one. So that's my y-axis and that's my x-axis. Ignore the modulus sign for now. How would you have plotted 3x, 5x minus 3, 3k? Now, they've said to k is a positive constant, so 5x minus a constant. Where do you think it would have crossed the y-axis? At that constant. So that point is minus 3k, and that's where it would be. On, the, on here. When x is 0, y will be minus 3k. That's it. For y to have become 0, what do you think x would have to be? x would have to be what? Well, if y equals 0, x would have to be 3k over 5. Okay, that's when you make x a subject. So x becomes 3k over 5. So at that point is where y crosses the so that's 3x over 5 3k over 5 is where it would also cross the y the x axis so now you have two points and it's a straight line graph so you're supposed to draw this with a straight line graph right that's the graph of y equals 5x minus 3k but we are talking of the modulus so where could it where do you think it was going to cross the x axis there that's where it bounces off as a reflection so there and it's going to be a complete reflection of whatever it was going to be here. So instead of minus 3k, that guy would now be 3k. And there, there you have it. You have your, your modulus graph for, 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 for the first one. 
Let's do the same for the second one. So, ignore that 3, okay? 3 is always a positive guy, so it doesn't matter if the 3 was outside the modulus or inside the modulus. So I'm going to plot for y equals 3x plus 12k, and then later put the modulus. So if we're looking at y equals 3x plus 12k, that's because I've, I've, I've brought the 3 in. It's a, it's a positive number, so it wouldn't really matter. The, how would the graph have looked like? When x is 0, y would have been 12k. So this would have happened somewhere up there, 12k. Okay. When, when x is 0, y would have been 12k. And what about when y is 0? x would have been minus 12, minus 4k. And that's me making x the subject when y is 0. x would have been minus 4k. So for y to be 0, x would have been here, minus 4k. And it's a straight line graph. So the graph should have actually just gone like that. But like we said, in terms of modulus, it's meant to be reflected wherever I should have crossed the x-axis so that it, it never becomes negative. So there it bounces off as positive, and there it's also positive. Okay, and that's the two of them drawn. Now, the question said, solve the inequality by sketching the graph, the equality of when the first graph was always greater than or equal to the second graph. First and foremost, this is where they are equal, so that's one of the solutions to our point. But when is this this first graph always greater than the second graph? Around this region of X, this it looks like the second graph is always greater, right? It's always on top of the first graph. Where does the first graph become on top of the second graph? Everything below that, everything here. That's where this first graph now seems to be on top in, in terms of the y. It's always on top of the second graph. So the second graph is now down. This is always up. This is going to be leading it forever going forward. And that is where we say everything. Okay, so what's that point going to be? Well, if you did sketch your graph, you could work out what that point is. So, what do you think that point would be. Do we have a graph sheet? If you had a graph sheet, then you could tell. But don't forget, you don't have values. You only have it in terms of k. In terms of k. So, in terms of k, if that mark, If this mark here is 3k over 5 and that mark is 4k, minus 4k, and that height there is 3k, the question is, if I make it like a Pythagoras, like a um, right angle triangle, what would this distance be? What would that distance be? Things like that. So that's the way we could look at it. Well, that's one way we could look at it. Another way we could look at it is just consider this as the normal graph that they are and solve them but actually we were meant to solve this using the graph not by any other mathematical method so it's possible that we can read it from here so there you have 4k and there you have 3k over 4 I've not drawn this to scale so it's most likely that I will not be able to read this properly so I think we have to go back to analytical method of trying to read out what that intercept would be. If anybody has a different ob um, observation or, or a different approach to this, please let us know. But I would say we would solve this analytically by saying what was the equation of that line of this of this line? That was the, the line 3x plus 12, right? So that was 3x plus 12k equals what was the equation of the line here well this particular line was 5x minus 3k we only reflected it on that side so that means it's the negative of what it should have been so minus 5x uh, minus 3k so negative outside that now that's what should be equal to that so 
going by that, we can say 3x plus 12k is minus 5x plus 3k. And trying to solve for k for x, bring the 5x to the left, it becomes 8x, and take the 12k to the other side, it becomes minus 9k. And so x is minus 9 over 8k. So that point where the meet was minus 9 over 8k. And so the solution would be x less than or equal to minus 9 over 8k. Because that's where everything on the first graph becomes higher than the second graph. Okay, now at this point I am going to stop this video and perhaps continue in another video questions 8, 9, and if they have 10 questions, we'll do all of them. 8, 9, and 10, and it looks like there's question 11 somewhere. Okay, good. So we had just three more questions to go. Now, once I do the three more questions in another video, because I don't want this video to be too long, once we do them, we would now look at core four, okay? But if I'm too slow in releasing the videos, please, feel free to come on, on Skype to ask any questions you think would help you prepare better for the exam. And that's my Skype, okay? Skype. Until next time, I'll see you. My name remains Ulu. Bye.